Hey. So today I want to talk about induction. This in and of itself isn't directly a differential equations topic. It's more so a proof technique or a principle of logic um, or an axiom of our system of mathematics, depending on how you want to want to look at it. Um, but we're going to use it quite a bit in the context of differential equations pretty much from now throughout the rest of the course. Um, so it um, but just be aware, it, it applies much more broadly than just in differential equations. Um, the statement of the principle of induction is written above here in words, and then so principle of induction up here in words, and then also down below in symbols, um, because it's, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so let's just read through it together. So we have P of N is a statement that's indexed by natural numbers. Um, so for a statement, just think of something that can be just a claim that something that can either be true or false. Um, and it's a statement that has a natural number n in the statement, right? So for example, n is prime. That's a statement involving a natural number n, right? Um, n is not prime. There's another statement involving the natural number n, right? So it could be whatever, um, any, any statement about it that has a natural number in it. Um, so let p of n be a statement. Then we want to um, first prove p of zero, right? So we want to prove that the statement p of zero is true. Then we want to argue that if for every natural number k, if you assume that p of k is true, you can then conclude that p of k plus one is true. Um, if you can do that, then you get to conclude that p of n is true for all natural numbers of n, and that that statement p of n is always true. Right? There are plenty of statements, p of n, that are true for some n, but not for others. For example, n is prime, right? And plug, you know, p of two is true, two is prime. p of three is true, three is prime. p of four is false, right? Four is not prime. So, um, so there are plenty of statements which are not true, which are only true for some n, um, but we're saying in this case, if you can carry out these steps, then p of n is true for every natural number n. Um, Okay, so that's kind of, you know, written out in words, the principle of, of mathematical induction. Um, you can also write it in symbols if you're familiar with quantifiers, with notation for quantifiers. Um, that's a, a common way that people write it. So the upside down A just represents for all, right? And I think of it as like the A in all. Um, so this says P of zero and for all K in the natural numbers, P of K implies, a little double arrow this implies, P of K implies P K plus one. You can do all that, then double arrow implies you get to conclude that for every natural number n, p of n is true, right? Um, so that's the just in words versus in symbols, but the same principle. Um, why does this work? Well, it basically works because um, so you know why why do we accept this as a as a valid form of proof? Well, you, it's a essentially a logical domino effect, right? Imagine that we've demonstrated this. Um, you know, if you've demonstrated that for all k, p of k implies p of k plus one, then what do you know? You know that p of zero implies p of one. That's what, that's what this statement says for k equals zero, right? That, what does this statement say for k equals one? It says p of one implies p of two, right? What does this statement say for k equals two? It says that p of two implies p of three and so on. Right. Um, so it's a giant pile of implications is what that um, what that for all represents. Right. And then what we're saying is if you just prove this, you just prove P of zero. So you prove P of zero. OK, well, P of zero is true, but that then causes P of one to be true, which then causes if P of one is true, then P of two is true. But then if P of two is true, P of three is true and so on, right? So then you've successfully proven that this statement is going to be true for all natural numbers and no matter how far down you go, right? So that's, um, so it's a bit of a logical domino effect is uh, kind of a nice way to, to look at it. Um, what's incredible here is you're, you're proving infinitely many statements, but you're only doing a finite amount of work, right? You're only doing um, just two steps, uh, P of zero, and then um, for all k, proof p of k implies p of k plus one. Those are only two steps, um, but your, your conclusion it contains infinitely many statements. Um, just a bit of language that you'll see with regards to induction. Um, you'll see this 
um, referred to as the base case when you prove P is zero, right? That's usually called the, the base case. Um, and then over here, this is usually called the induction step. So right here, the, the, for all this is called the induction step. Um, so you'll see, you know, since there's always sort of two, proof, two parts to an induction proof, typically people will, will name them. Um, so now I want to demonstrate an example of an of a inductive argument. So for example, let's um, conjecture a formula for the sum 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared plus dot 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 to the n right for this sum um, and then prove that your correction prove that your conjecture is true using induction, right? So here, you know, you might already know a formula from this if you remember the geometric series formula from Calc 2, right? You can certainly do it that way. Um, but here I wanna do it kind of from scratch. Let's not assume that we, you know, maybe we forgot the geometric series formula and we're just gonna start kind of tinkering with this from scratch. Um, what might you do to solve a problem like this? So, so I'm not gonna jump right into an induction. Um, First, I'm just going to play around. I just want to try this out for some small examples. So let's make a little table of values, right? So let's start with a table of values. And I'm going to write out this sum for different n values. So let's do n versus the value of this summation, right? So one plus two plus two squared plus dot, 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 up to two to the n. So if n is zero, then this is just one because I stop at two to the zero, right? If n is one, I have one plus two gives me three. If n is two, I have one plus two plus two squared gives me seven. If n is three, I have one plus two plus two squared plus two cubed gives me 15. If n is four, I have one plus two plus two squared plus two cubed plus two to the fourth gives me um, 15 and 16 is 31, right? So, so I'm just doing arithmetic there. I'm just evaluating this for some values um, of n, right? So now at this point, you might start to notice something, right? You might notice some nice structure here. These values, let's see, we're playing with powers of two, we're adding up powers of two. Oh, and the values that I'm getting are very closely related to powers of two. Right, this is just one less than a power of two. This is just one less than a power of two. This is just one less than a power of two. You know, and, th and this is where, you know, maybe that requires a little bit of um, insight or, right, you have to kind of notice that is a bit of a rabbit out of a hat, but it's, but it's you know, given the fact that we're using two powers um, in the problem statement, right, maybe it's reasonable that two powers might somehow be involved in the, um, in the results. So, and, and we can maybe state this even a little bit more um, carefully by writing it as powers of two. So this is two to the fifth minus one, two to the fourth minus one, two to the third minus one, two squared minus one, and two to the one minus one. So now when I look at this, I say, okay, I have, I think I have a good conjecture. So let's conjecture that for a generic n, right? Just some general n where when I write out this sum, right, I'm going to conjecture and now I'm going to put, you know, a question mark over my equal sign here because I don't know this yet. I'm just conjecturing it based on a pattern, right? I'm going to conjecture that this is two to the n plus one minus one because it, well, it was in the five cases that I worked out. I'm just noticing a pattern, right? Um, it was always, you know, say when n was four, well, it was two to the five minus one, right? It was always one more than the n value. Um, the power of two was one more than the n value, but then subtract one. So maybe it's, maybe it's always true, right? Is this always true? I, I don't know, right? That's why I have a question mark written there, but I now have a conjecture. This is now my statement P of n. 
right? So I'm going to conjecture, meaning I'm not certain of this, but I suspect that it's true. I might like to, to try to prove that it's true. Um, you know, based on some data, I'm going to conjecture that the statement P of N, which P of N is going to be this summation, right? We're going to define this to be our P of N. I'm going to conjecture that this equality is true for, for all natural numbers n. So that's what I would like to attempt to prove by induction. All right. So, the, and the hope is, you know, you could either prove this by induction or maybe you could, maybe we just didn't go, if we can't get the induction proof to work out, maybe we just didn't go far enough in the table. Maybe if we go a few more rows down, maybe we'll find a counter example. Maybe we'll find a row where it does not work. Um, but let's, let's try to prove it, right? Let's try to prove this for induction. So by, the, by induction. So let's do proof by induction. All right, let's see if we can get this to work out. So like I mentioned before, there's always two parts to an induction proof. Um, there's always a base case and an induction step because those are the two parts of the axiom of induction, right? I need to prove that it's true for zero. And then I need to show that if it's true, basically in row K of that table, then the next row, um, row K plus one, it'll, it'll still match, right? It'll still, in our formula, it'll still be true. So let's do this, uh, let's do the base case first. So P of zero is true. Well, because I already checked it in the table, right? P of zero is true because um, one equals two to the one minus one, right? We, we verified that already. I'm just stating it again in our proof. Yes, this is the calculation we did in this row right here in our row zero in our table. Um, but it, you know, I just want to kind of see it again. Um, so that's the, that's the base case. Then I want to do the induction step. So for the induction step, I want to have, um, I want, I want to let K be a natural number and I want to assume P of K. That is, I want to assume that 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared plus up to 2 to the k is equal to 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. Right? This is the um, assumption. This assumption, often just that part p of k right there, um, this often is given a special name. So this is, and this isn't really part of the proof. I'm just sort of commenting how people refer to this. Um, this is often called the induction hypothesis. Because we're, you know, we're going to hypothesize, you know, hypothetically, what if this was true, right? What if, what if this were true, um, this statement for K, right? One plus two plus two squared up to two to the K equals two to the K plus one. Hypothetically, if that were true, what could we conclude from here, right? That's what they call the induction hypothesis. Um, and now this is, um, right, and, and this is always, this induction hypothesis, this is always part of an induction proof, right? This is essentially right right here where you assume P of K, right? Or if we're doing it in the words, right, right here, right? We're saying this is, right, this is the induction hypothesis. Um, so that's always going to be part of your, your, your proof. Um, so that's, um, uh, you know, very necessary start start to the induction step um, is declaring an arbitrary natural number k and assuming p of k. From this, we hope we can conclude p of k plus one, right? We now wish to conclude p of k plus one from this assumption, right? Is is the the hope. Um, so what do I, what is PK plus one? Well, PK plus one means that the same um, equality holds if K plus one is plugged into the, um, 
in for n in in that statement p of n, right? So I'm going to start with the left hand side of that equality. And hopefully just simplify until we hit the right hand side. Right. That is our um, our plan here. So the left hand side of the desired equation, right? One plus two plus two squared plus up to two to the k plus one. That's the left-hand side of the equation that we want, right? We want to start with that and we want to get to two to the k plus two minus one. That's our goal. So how can I do that? How can I clean this up? Well, I don't know anything about this summation, but if I write it, this is maybe a slightly funny looking step. If I write it like this, now I've found something that I know something about. So I, in that dot, 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 what would be the penultimate term? What would be the term just before 2 to the k plus 1? Well, it would be 2 to the k, because it's a summation of consecutive powers of 2. So that 2 to the k, right, that's the, the next to last term. Well, now look at this. We have right here, I know what this equals by my induction hypothesis, right? So apply the induction hypothesis right there. See, that's what I assumed. I assumed, hey, I already checked my little table up here, right? You're assuming K is like some, you know, whatever that stopping point, however far you made it in your table, right? Which in our case was four. However far you made it in your table, I've already checked up to K, up to row K. Now I'm going to see if I can use the truth at row K to tell something about row K plus one. That's that's the, the mindset here, right? Um, so I can use the fact that um, one plus two up to two to the K, I already know what that is. That is two to the K plus one minus one. Right, so I'm just substituting right there um, from the, the induction hypothesis, right? And, and this, sometimes people will, sometimes you'll see people kind of mark this in their proof. Um, they'll write something like IH for induction hypothesis over the equal sign or, or sometimes off to the side, they'll put IH on the side. Um, it's, you know, it's not necessary, but sometimes, sometimes people use that notation. Kind of like how you put LHR if you applied L'Hopital's rule in the middle of a limit calculation is, is kind of similar. Um, so now from here, the rest is just algebra. I have two copies of two to the K plus one, right? I have a quantity added to itself, which is times two. Um, then just do a power property of exponents, right? Common base, multiplication, add the exponents. So two to the K plus two minus one, great, I did it, right? I proved the um, the statement P K plus one. And if you wanna be really careful about it, you can even do this. You can even say it's two to the K plus one plus one minus one. So you can really see that N, where N used to be in our conjecture, you can see that K plus one sitting there. So it's, you know, maybe a little a hair more rigorous, um, right? So um, at the end of this, we, accomplished it, right? Thus, we have shown that um, pk plus one now is true, right? Because pk plus one, right? I added all the powers up to two, K, two to the k plus one, and it became that same formula, right? Our conjecture was still valid on step k plus one. Um, so since pk plus one is true, given the assumption of pk, right? Now our induction step is complete. And the base case was complete. So now we did it, right? Together, those two steps imply um, that it's true, p of n is always true, right? So by induction, we now know that the statement one plus two plus two squared plus two to the n equals two to the n plus one minus one for all natural numbers n. Right, we did it. So um, the induction proof is is now finished. Right, and we'll put a little box for our end of proof symbol. Um, so this is this is now a complete induction proof. Right, and it verifies that our conjecture is 
um, no longer just a conjecture. It's now a theorem, right? So you get to do the very satisfying thing of you know revising and putting a, a much stronger word there, right? This is we don't have to leave it as conjecture anymore. This is now a theorem, right? We verified this beyond any shadow of a doubt. You don't need to go and check, you know, manually more rows in this table. You know, there will never be a counterexample. You can go up as high as you like in the natural numbers. There will never, never be a counterexample here. Um, so this is true for all in, right? Um, and like I mentioned before, this is a this is a consequence of the geometric series formula. So if you know if you've already seen that in Calc two. Maybe the result wasn't super surprising, but uh, but but this is a very different take on it than probably you saw in Calc two, right? Um, this is proving it via induction as opposed to um, as opposed to um, how you might prove it in in Calc two, maybe using a uh, Taylor series or derivatives, right? So, all right, so there's a, a proof by induction. Now you might say, wait, but differential equations, right? And the title is differential equations induction. What, what does this have to do with differential equations? Well, lots. Um, you, um, in particular, you have lots of things in differential equations that are indexed by natural numbers, right? Um, you know, you can have a first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative. Okay, well, there's n, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, right? Um, so, so oftentimes statements involving iterated derivatives come up in differential equations. Um, that's one place where you'll see induction. Um, and there's many more, but we'll, for example, in Laplace transforms, so many identities in Laplace transforms are proofs by induction. Um, but let's let's look at something involving derivatives, a little more of a calculus kind of looking um, versus just a finite series. Let's do the following. Let's, you know, so here's an exercise. Um, let's find the, let's find the general solution to the differential equation. y nth derivative of y equals zero, right? And here I don't mean nth power of y, but nth derivative of y, right? So let's find the general solution to that differential equation. Um, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with just like we did before, a little table, do some conjectures, right? Um, and then prove, prove that your answer is correct via induction. So here we're solving a nth order differential equation um, and we're verifying our solution using induction, right? So here's how I might start. Um, let's start by just analyzing it for n equals zero. Okay, well, if n equals zero, um, then the only solution is the constant function y of x equals zero, right? That's the only solution, okay. What if n is one? Then I have y prime equals zero. Okay, well, what kind of functions have first derivative equal to zero? Constant functions, right? So there, I didn't even really do any, um, you know, I didn't do any snazzy diffy q integrating factors or anything like that, right? Um, here, I just sort of thought about it, right? What, um, what kind of function differentiates to zero? Constant functions differentiate to zero. Okay, how about second derivative equals zero? Okay, well, Let's see, if the second derivative is zero, then the first derivative must have been constant, right? Because I just said that a first derivative being zero means the original function was constant, uh, which then means, now what's the antiderivative of a constant? Okay, well now y of x must be, um, must be c times x plus some other constant, right? Where c and d are in the again in the real numbers, right? So you can think of it as taking two antiderivatives at each step. We get a constant of integration. Um, you know that that's a perfectly good way to think of it, right? All right. How about n equals three? Well, this is kind of going to continue, right? I have okay. If the third derivative was zero, the second derivative must have been constant. So then the first derivative must have been linear. So then the original function must have been quadratic, right? Where C, D, and E are in R. Um, and, you know, I'm going to do something to clean it up a little bit. 
right? C is um, already a constant. So C over two is also a constant. So maybe just, we can just ditch that, that over two, right? Just to, just to kind of clean it up. Um, okay, at this point, I might have a, a conjecture, right? What would the, what would the solution set be? Set to the nth derivative of a function equaling zero. That differential equation. Well, let's see. In um, for degree one, it's a set of all. For n equals one, it's a set of all degree zero polynomials. For n equals two, it's a set of all degree one polynomials. For n equals three, it's a set of all degree two polynomials. Okay, I'm gonna conjecture that the solution set to this is um, the set of all. degree and minus one polynomials, which if we want to write that out, we can, right? We can say this is just, um, you know, C0 plus C1x plus C2x squared plus dot, 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 up to Cn minus one, x to the n minus one, where these Cs, C0, C1, up to Cn minus one, are all real numbers. So this is our this is our solution set. Um, now, again, let's do a proof by induction. Um, here, we have to restructure things a tiny bit. The base case doesn't quite fit this form, right? Because if you plug in zero into the base case, or if you're probably getting zero, right, it says, it, then it talks about degree negative one polynomials, you, right? Um, so, you know, maybe you take a convention that, um, that, you know, the polynomial or the polynomial zero has degree minus one, maybe that's a convention that you choose, and maybe in certain contexts, it makes sense to, um, to make that convention. But here, we're going to kind of avoid that debate, and we'll, we'll just, um, do two base cases, right? We'll just say, um, or, or we'll actually just say that, you know, if n is zero, sorry, we'll, we won't do two base cases. We'll just say if n is zero, then it doesn't quite fit this form, but that's okay. I know what the solution is for n equals zero. So just don't worry about that too much. And we'll just move our base case up one level. We'll just put our base case here instead. And that's one nice thing about the axiom of induction is if you just start your base case a little bit higher, like maybe some small cases are kind of weird just start your base case higher instead of doing p of zero as your base case, do p of one as your base case. Maybe the first couple are weird. Maybe do p of five as your base case, right? It's okay if you start with a bigger base case. Um, then it just, then the induction just proves it from there on, on out. Um, so here, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna qualify this a little bit. The solution set to this um, differential equation and derivative of y equals zero is the set of all degree n minus one polynomials. We'll just say for um, all, natural numbers with n greater than or equal to one, right? We'll just exclude zero from our conjecture and that's that's okay. We we understand what's happening for n equals zero um, anyway, right? We, we can, the zero derivative of y equals zero implies that y equals zero. That's, that it's not the super um, interesting case, right? Um, so let's now do this by induction, right? So the base case, again, we worked out the base case already, right? We have the base case is just that um, the differential equation y prime equals zero has solution set just you know, c zero where c zero is a real number. So I'm, I'm not really doing anything um, fundamentally new. I'm just th that I haven't done up here. I'm just putting it in the notation of our conjecture. I'm just indexing it with c sub zero, right? Um, so that's fine. Um, right, so p of one is true. There's our base case, right? Then I want to do the induction step. Um, oh, and I should also say, I, I should be very explicit about what p of n is, right? So this statement here, so the solution set to y, um, the derivative of y equals zero is the solution set, is a set of all degree n minus one polynomials, this, right? That 
statement right here ending at that set, right? This is our statement P of A. So in those quotes, right? That the solution set to that differential equation is the, of this form. That's our statement P of A that we're now using in our proof. Right? So, um, so that's our base case. That, and then we want our induction step. All right, so induction step then is um, to say, okay, assume P of K. Right, so what am I assuming? I'm assuming that the general solution to the kth derivative of a function equaling zero is this set, C0 plus C1, X plus C2, X squared plus dot, 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 plus C sub K minus one, X to the K minus one, where these Cs are real numbers. Right, that's our um, that's our assumption, right? Now, given this, we wish to solve this differential equation. Right, because using this knowledge, we already know what the solution of the kth derivative um, equaling zero v or equaling zero is. Right now, I want to solve this differential equation. Well, here's here's what I could do. I'm going to make a substitution, and my su substitution is going to be v equals y prime. Right. I'm going to substitute the v equals y prime. Because then this transforms the e equation that we don't know much about, right? The DE y to the k plus one equals zero into VK equals zero. Because V is the first derivative of y. So maybe to show kind of an intermediate step there, right? What what just happened? Why is that the case? Well. Because if you do the kth derivative of v, well, v is the first derivative of y. And the kth derivative of a first derivative is a k plus one, k plus first, k plus one, however you say that, k plus first derivative um, of, of y, right? How about this? k derivatives and one derivative results in k plus one derivatives. There we go. That's certainly fine. When in doubt, just go, go around. Um, so there's our um, differential equation. This transforms it into. Oh, but that's exactly the induction hypothesis. We, we, it's written with a different variable, but we already know the solution to the kth derivative of an unknown function equaling zero. And that's exactly what we have here, right? So by the induction hypothesis, right, we know that the solution to vk equals zero has what form? V of x equals c of zero plus c one x c two x squared plus dot 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 plus c to the c sub k minus one x to the k minus one, right? For right where these are all real numbers. So this this is the solution, the general solution based on our induction hypothesis. Okay, well, now what I can do is I can plug in get um, y back in there, right? So say v of x is then v of x then is y prime, right? Um, so sub I'm just using the fact that V equals Y prime to get it back in terms of Y. Um, and then integrate both sides, right? This differential equation is already separated. It's separable and separated, right? Just go ahead, integrate both sides. And what do we get? We get Y of X equals um, C. Now there's a new, um, plus C that's going to get introduced here, right? So I'll call that CK. And then we have C0 X, and then I have C1 over two X squared and C2 over three X cubed and so on, right? With CK minus one over K 
x to the k. Right, this is the, the new um, formula that I get for y of x. Okay, well, th this, oh, and now I should mention now, right, c0, c1, c2, all the way up to ck are real numbers as opposed to just up to k minus one. All right, well, now we have a new solution set. But look at, um, you know, we could clean up these constants, right? We can say, that these constants even, you know, C1 over two, just that's still just a constant, call it something. C2 over three, that's just a constant, call it whatever you want, right? Um, so I'm gonna do some renaming, right? And I'm gonna, in particular, I'm gonna rename these, um, right? I'm gonna rename this one to be C0. I'm gonna rename this constant to be C1. This constant I'm gonna call C2. This constant I'm gonna call C3 and so on up to this one, which I'm going to call CK, right? So when I do that, the solution set is y of x equals C0 plus C1x plus C2x squared, and so on up to CKx to the k, where all of those c's are real numbers, right? There's our there's our solution set. So P of K plus one is true, right? It has followed from P of K. So our induction step is complete, right? And by induction, we end our proof, right? So by induction, P of N is true for all natural numbers in greater than or equal to one, right? Zero didn't quite fit the pattern. That's why our base case was at, set at one. Um, and the proof is complete. So we, so there we go. We solved an infinite family of differential equations. We didn't just solve one differential equation. We solved infinitely many differential equations, right? And, but we did it with only a finite amount of work, right? We had y, the nth derivative of y equals zero. That's an infinite family of differential equations. We found the solution set um, to all of those in just two steps, a base case and an induction step, right? So solving infinitely many, differential equations with just two steps. That certainly calls for a victory drum solo if I ever heard one. Animal drum.